Alright, this is AP AB Calc. We are doing the third video in section 1.4, which is the Intermediate Value Theorem, or IVT. Uh, it's on page 77 of your textbook, but I'm going to walk you through it as well. So, we're going to walk through the actual words, we're going to walk through an example that's not math, uh, and then we'll do some math examples and sort of talk how you can translate what this math says. So, um, if f is a continuous function uh, on the closed window, that's what the brackets mean, closed, from a to b, so you include the x equals a and the x equals b, and k is any number in between the y values that go with those x values. So f of a is the y value that goes with a, f of b is the y value that goes with x equals b. Then for at least one c in a, b, f of c equals k. So for some x value in this open window from a to b, you have to get an output of k. All right, so let's talk about a couple things. So first thing, you can look at a theorem and often from the name get a clue as to what they're talking about. So the, now that's not always true if it's like a theorem that is named after a person, right? Fermat's last theorem doesn't give you any hints other than that Fermat came up with it. Um, but the intermediate value theorem is talking about a value that lies between things, right? That's what intermediate means. It means lies between, right? Like if you're, if you play something, a sport at an intermediate level, you are in between uh, a novice and a professional, right? You're some kind of intermediate level. So um, we're talking about a value between two things. Okay, so. If we look at my example that is not math, so uh, Carver ENS is at 16th, right? Uh, we're going to say that it's at 16th and, and Norris, right? But up here, okay, so 16th and Norris. Uh, we're going to call it on 16th. I know that that's not actually how streets work because if you were actually on a road, you would get hit by buses and such, but you get my drift. Uh, and Qdoba is down at Cecil B uh, and uh, Broad Street, right? And again, we're going to say it's actually on Broad Street to make my point, even though I understand that it's not actually on Broad Street. Okay, so... Um, if you were to start at Carver ENS and you wanted to walk to Qdoba, no matter how you choose to do it, other than circumnavigating the globe and going up and around, like passing the Arctic, going around the backside of the planet and coming up, you have to cross Montgomery Avenue, right? So you could choose to walk, right? You could choose to walk down 16th all the way and then walk down to Qdoba, but look, you cross Montgomery, right? You could choose to walk through the temple track, and then down 15th, and over, but oh look, you crossed Montgomery, right? You could choose to walk up to Norris inexplicably, because you're bad at directions, all the way down Broad Street, oh but look, you crossed Montgomery, right? So, point being, there's no path, I mean, you could, I don't know, uh, you could do all sorts of weird things, right? Like, you could, you could walk down, you could walk along Montgomery, and then cross, doesn't matter, like, you could do a bunch of stuff, it doesn't matter, eventually you're going to land uh, crossing Montgomery Street, right? That's the idea. So in this situation, my Montgomery lies between my F of A, which is all the way up here, and my F of B. See how if I want to go from F of A to F of B, I had to cross K somewhere? I don't know where, but I know it's going to have to cross. So what, what this theorem tells you is it doesn't tell you where you cross this line of Y equals K, but it tells you that somewhere in the middle, if you start above a value and end below a value, you have to cross it. So we're going to do a math example with the IVT, um, but the important thing to note here is the IVT only works if you are a continuous function, because if you were allowed to magically teleport, right, which is essentially what a graph that has a jump looks like, right, a graph that has a jump looks like you teleported. Well, if you're not continuous, then you don't have to cross Montgomery, because if you're this crazy, like, awesome superhero, and you're able to be like, I'm going to walk to here, but then I'm bored, I'm just going to teleport, and you just teleport down here and walk over, well, if you had that ability, then you wouldn't have had to cross Montgomery, right? So, again, all of this relies on f being a continuous function, okay? So, really, two things have to be true to apply the IBT. Number one, f is continuous. Number two, the number k has to lie between those two endpoints. So, let's walk through an example of this with math. Uh, this would be our E3, okay? So, um, f of x equals x cubed minus 7x plus 1. Uh, let's do, um, show f of x equals 0 for at least 1x in the window from 1 to 10. Okay, so this is an example. 
example where I can apply the IBT and I just made up numbers, but it is what it is. Okay, so first thing, in order to apply the IBT, I have to ask myself, does the IBT apply, right? Because sometimes the answer is gonna be no, hey, it doesn't, right? So, um, or, so I'm gonna write, or say, why you can't, okay? Um, and actually, that's not the way the AP would phrase it. Let me take that back. The AP would say, um, does f of x equals zero for at least one value? Um, so uh, justify your answer. And they're not going to say use the intermediate value theorem, but that's really what they're asking you to do. So if the intermediate value theorem didn't apply, you would say so. And if the intermediate value theorem does apply, you need to show that it applies. So does the IVT apply? Number one, is f of x continuous? Yes. Because it's a polynomial, and that's really all the justification. I, I know it's a polynomial. It's a, it is acceptable to have memorized that polynomials are nice, happy, continuous functions. Second thing, um, so my k is 0, right? I need to find out what the y value of the two endpoints are. So f of 1 is a 1 minus 7 plus 1, which is a negative 5. And f of 10 is a 1,000 minus a 70 plus a 1, right, which should be 931, right, because 0 is between those two numbers, right, 0 is bigger than 5 and smaller than 931, right, because all I needed to know was that that was a positive, in fact, even if, if you were flipping out about the 931, you really have to only have to know it's positive, so, so yes, right, 0 is between them, so by the IBT, yes, and I don't have to find when, I just have to say, hey, look, the IVT applies, so by the IVT, at some point between those two, I have to cross the axis. Now, if you're having trouble picturing why, let me just show you a really terrible version of this graph. Uh, at 1, the value was negative 5. At 10, right, so there's 1, there's 10, right, the value was 931. If I'm not allowed to pick up my pencil, there's no way I get from here to here without crossing the axis somewhere, right? I Just like we couldn't get from school to Qdoba without crossing Montgomery Avenue. There's no way I get from here to here without crossing the axis. I might not know where I cross the axis, but I know that somewhere in this window uh, from, uh, so, and actually I should have put these as open, but you get the idea. Okay. So again, I need to show that the function is continuous, and then I need to show that whatever value they want lies between the two endpoints, because if you're not allowed to pick up your pen, and you start below a number and end above a number, then you have to cross that number. So let's do a P3 that's similar. Same question, right? Uh, just so, again, same idea. P3. Um, let's say G of X equals X plus 1 over X minus 2. Oh, that's mean. Hold on. I'll do that in my next example. Sorry, that was mean. Uh, let's do x to the fourth minus 6x plus 2. Okay, that's not awful. Um, so does g of x equal, let's do 100 Yeah, that's fair. Um, no, I lied. I take it back. Uh, does g of x equal uh, um, 10 uh, on the interval from 2 to Uh, and again, justify your answer. Okay, so um, you can pause me if you want. I'm going to go ahead and walk through it. Okay, so the question is, does IVT apply, right? And if it does, then the answer is, yep, that's, that's why it happens, right? So number one, G of X is continuous, right? It is because it's a polynomial, right? You don't even have to specify. You can just say, hey, look, my eyeballs told me that that, that nice, happy polynomial is continuous. Number two, G of 2 would be a 16 minus a 12 plus a 2, right, uh, which should be a 6. 
right? Uh, and g of 3 should be an 81 minus an 18 plus a 2, right? Uh, which, here's the honest answer, and I'm going to kind of be a lazy bum here. Um, I know that this number is bigger than 10, right? I know that 6 is smaller than 10, and I know that even if you wanted to be a lazy bum and not figure out this number, which is honestly what I did when I was writing the problem, uh, you could technically be a lazy bum. If you want to figure it out, right, you can figure out that it's a 63, right? Um, that's fine, right? Uh, do I mean that? Hang on. If it was a 20... It'd be a 61 plus 2 would be a 60. Oh, sorry, no, it's a 65, right? Sorry, my brain just died. Um, so, point being, uh, you can figure out that this is a 65 if you want, right? Uh, but you don't have to, right? Because the honest answer is that uh, you just need to know it's bigger than 10, right? So, 6 is smaller than 10, which is smaller than 65, which is true. So, Yes, by the IBT, the number falls in between. So honestly, I'd be pretty lazy if I were just trying to figure out why. I would probably say something. In fact, you could even be really lazy. You could figure this out in your head, and you'd be like, I don't know what number that is, but I know that 10 is smaller than whatever that G of 3 is, and that that's bigger than that 6, which was G of 2. Okay, cool, it's good, right? So uh, you don't have to absolutely kill yourself, because my brain totally broke doing this for a second, and sometimes your brain's going to break too. So yes, by the IBT, I have to cross that value. Um, it doesn't always happen that the first value is the lower number and the second value is the higher number. It just happened in the two examples I gave you. So let's do an E4. Uh, I'll do uh, sort of the one I was just going to discuss with you a second ago. So E4. Um, so same question. Right? Um, except for A, I'm going to give you G of X equals X plus 1 over X minus 2. Um, does g of x equal, um, uh, does g of x equal negative 1 on the interval from 0 to 1? Right. Okay, and then for B, I'm going to ask you the same question. G of x equals x plus 1 over x minus 2. Uh, does g of x equal, let's see, um, um, 0 on the interval from... one to four, okay? So same problem, but just different questions. Okay, so uh, we're gonna walk through E4 together. All right, so when I walk through E4, let's start with A, right? The first question I have to ask myself is, does the IBT apply, right? And that, that involves two things. The first thing it involves is, is G of X continuous? And again, you don't have to be continuous everywhere, you just have to be continuous on this window. Well, I see that g of x has a denominator, and I notice that that means g of x has a vertical asymptote when x minus 2 is 0, which would be at x equals 2. So I then look at the window and say yes, because it has a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, but the window is 0 to 1, right? I just have to be continuous on the window that I was given. So yes, it's continuous. Second question. What is g of 0? Well, that would be 1 over negative 2, right? And uh, what is g of 1? Well, that would be a 2 over a, what did I plug in a 1? A negative 1, so it's a negative 2, right? So, sure enough, uh, if you look at these numbers, right, negative 1 does fall in between them, right? Negative 1 is bigger than negative 2, which was my g of 1, and smaller than my negative 1 half, which was my g of 0. So yes, yes, by the IBT, I don't know what value of g of x gives me a negative 1, but I know that there has to be at least 1. Now, 
we go over and look at B, the question we ask is, does IVT apply? Well, I can answer this one pretty quickly because I already did part of this in A. Is G of X continuous? And again, it's continuous. So remember, you need to be continuous on the interval you're asked about. Well, am, is my function continuous on the interval from 1 to 4? The answer is no. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. So no, uh, IVT does not apply. I don't even have to do the second half of the IVT. I just need to say, hey, look, I can't use the IVT. I am not guaranteed uh, at least one value. All right, there's not a window. And again, I worded this poorly. I kind of did not word these examples as well as I worded the other ones because I was sort of being lazy. Uh, the wording you're going to see is, must there be at least one value, right? So um, sometimes they'll do you a solid and say, does the IVT guarantee there's at least one value? But uh, in this instance, uh, obviously I didn't, and I don't think you'll see it most of the time. Most of the time they're going to word it in a way that they don't give away the theorem they want you to list. Uh, so let's do a P4 that's the same idea. Uh, and that'll pretty much be this section. So P4, same question, right? Um, so for P4, uh, let's do f of x equals x mm, minus 3 over x minus 5, right? Um, So must f of x equal, um, let's do and so the f of x equal 2 uh, on the window from 4 to 6. And so that's a. And for b, we're going to use the same function. Uh, and we're going to ask must f of x equal I'm going to go ahead and do the problem. So, um, again, first thing I have to ask myself is, does the IVT apply, right? Um, so I noticed that f of x has a denominator, which means that there's going to be a discontinuity when the denominator equals 0, so at x equals 5. As soon as I notice that there's a discontinuity at 5, I notice that g of x, or sorry, not g, rather, f, that f of x is not continuous on the window from 4 to 6, because there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 5, so I can stop and say IVT does not apply. Now, it's a bit of a trap, because if you had bothered to do the second part to test it, and you'd found f of 4 and f of 6, you would have found that they do surround 2. But that's not enough information for you to know if the graph crosses 2, uh, because, again, discontinuous, right? So uh, now if we go to do b, right, again, we sort of already cheated because I gave you uh, the same function, right? So I know that the only discontinuity is at 5, so I know that f of x is continuous uh, because 5 isn't in that 6 to 7 window, right? So 5 is not in the window from 6 to 7, so f of x is continuous. I then say, okay, well, what is f of 6? Well, that's going to be 6 minus 3 over 6 minus 5, so that's a 3. And f of 7 is going to be 7 minus 3 over 7 minus 5, which is 4 over 2 or 2. Sure enough, 2.5 falls right in between those two numbers, right? f of 7 is smaller than 2.5, which is smaller than f of 6, right? Because this was a 2 and this was a 3. So yes, by the IVT, there must be a value in that window where f of x equals 2.5, okay? So that's kind of the gist of it. Uh, you'll see this a lot on an AP where they ask you to justify why a graph must have a zero. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of times where one of these values is positive and one's negative. So if you have values that switch from positive to negative or negative to positive, you have to cross zero. And that's as long as your function's continuous. And that's really the way you're going to see this most of the time on an AP. So that's 1.4.